Hi there. Thank you so much for that introduction. And uh, thank you for inviting me to be here. It's uh, lovely to be in Paris. The first time I ever came to Paris, I was 19 years old, and it was a complete accident. I had been traveling around Europe. Uh, it was the first time I'd ever traveled alone. It was really the first time I'd ever traveled at all. And I was in northern Italy, and my flight inconveniently was leaving the next day from Madrid. So I got on a night train from Italy to Madrid. But I didn't really understand European trains very well. My Italian was horrible. It still is. And what I didn't know was that the train was going to split in half in the middle of the night, and only half of it was going to go to Madrid, which turned out not to be the half that I was on. So I wake up in the morning. I'm in the wrong country. I have no French francs. This is long before the day of the Euro. It's also long before the day of easy internet access and cell phones and just being able to call someone and have them bail you out. And of course, uh, very soon it's clear to me that I'm going to miss my flight back to New York. On the other hand, I am in Paris. <laughs> and this, I think, is kind of representative of our mistakes. Uh, they are a pain, they are confusing, they are often costly, they change our plans, sometimes in very frustrating ways. But they bring us to amazing places, and places that we never meant to go. And that can be a really, really wonderful experience. And I think it's not an accident that this particular mistake happened for me while I was traveling. I mean, the thing about traveling is that we're going somewhere new, and we don't understand how things work around us, and inevitably, we make a lot of mistakes. And that's true, I think, not just of literally going to new places, but figuratively going to new places as well. Anytime we have a new project, a new relationship, a new business, uh, we are very, very likely to make a lot of mistakes along the way. And for me personally, uh, that, that Paris mistake, the train mistake, was uh, fairly representative of how I was about to spend the entire rest of my adult life. My background is in international journalism, I travel a lot, and therefore I make a lot of mistakes. And in fact, I want to get started today by telling you about another and, um, frankly, even sillier mistake that I once made while traveling in my own country. This is about one year after the Paris mistake, and I'm still in college at this point, and a friend and I take the summer off, and we drive across the United States from the East Coast to the West Coast. The US is a very large country. And we are a very long way into this trip when I finally turn to my friend and ask her a question that has been bothering me for 3,000 kilometers. What's up with the Chinese character I keep seeing by the side of the road? My friend just looks at me absolutely blankly like the entire front row of this auditorium. <laughs> and I'm like, you know, all these signs we keep seeing with the Chinese character on them. She just stares at me. And then suddenly she starts to laugh, because she figures out what I'm talking about. And what I'm talking about is this. Right, the famous Chinese character for picnic area. <laughs> I'm telling you this story because I have spent the last five years of my life thinking about situations exactly like this, about why we misunderstand the signs around us, how we behave when that happens, and what all of this can tell us about human nature. In other words, I have spent the last five years of my life thinking about being wrong. Now, this might strike you as a kind of strange career move, but it does have one tremendous advantage, which is that there's absolutely no job competition. In fact, in my experience, most of us go out of our way to avoid thinking about being wrong. Although, actually, that's not exactly right. 
we do think sometimes about being wrong, but we turn out to think about it in a very strange way. If you really examine how we look at being wrong, it really seems like we act as if there are some things in life that are fallible and some things that are not. And I want to spend a moment and look at this kind of closely because it's very strange when you look at it. So what do we think is fallible? Well, the human species, for one thing. You know, we all understand that people, in general, make mistakes. In fact, this idea that human beings make mistakes is absolutely central in a non-trivial way to every single major system we have ever come up with to understand what it means to be a human being, to be one of us. So whether you look at philosophy or psychology or religion or science, these are incredibly different domains. They don't agree with each other about almost anything, but they agree on this one point, which is that in some important way, to be a human is to be fundamentally fallible. And we actually all understand this in our everyday lives, too, which is why we say things, at least in English, you know, we have these expressions like, to err is human. And, you know, when we make a mistake and we say, eh, you know, I'm only human. So we understand on the kind of big picture that everybody makes mistakes. We also have no problem at all recognizing when other people are making mistakes, especially when those other people happen to disagree with us. In fact, arguably, we are a little bit too good at this. Tell me something, is there, a, is there a French translation, a French equivalent for the English phrase, I told you so? Wait, wait, what is it? Say it again. Je te l'avais qu'a dit. How many, five words? More or less, okay. Is it the most fun phrase to say in French? Because it is in English, right? We derive this incredibly sort of like sadistic little jolt of pleasure out of pointing out other people's mistakes to them. So we're very good at that. Interestingly, and somewhat more strangely, we're also perfectly good at recognizing that we ourselves have made mistakes in the past. So I have no problem at all standing up here and telling you about my, you know, stupid Chinese character mistake. And if I had more time, I could actually tell you about other and much more serious mistakes that I've made and about convictions that I used to hold that, honestly, I no longer agree with. And the same thing goes for the future, right? I don't know when I'm going to make mistakes, I don't know what those mistakes are going to be, but I am absolutely certain that all the way down the line, until the day I go to my grave, I am going to make mistakes. So actually, this is a fairly comprehensive portrait of fallibility. But there's one very important thing missing from it which is me here right now. When it comes down to the present tense, to all the beliefs that I hold in this exact moment, suddenly this lovely abstract appreciation for fallibility goes out the window. You know, I'm standing here right now and I cannot actually tell you a single thing I think I'm wrong about. And the problem, of course, is that the present tense is where we live. You know, we go to meetings in the present tense, and we come to conferences in the present tense, and we go on family vacations in the present tense, and we go to the polls and vote in the present tense. So effectively, we all wind up moving through life kind of trapped inside this bubble of feeling incredibly correct about everything. I think this is a major problem. I think it's a problem for each of us as individuals in our personal and professional lives. And I think it's a problem for all of us collectively as a culture. So what I want to do today is first of all talk about why we get stuck inside this feeling of being right. Second of all, why I think it's such a problem. And finally, I want to convince you that it is possible to step outside of that attachment to rightness. And that if, in fact, we can do so, it is one of the single greatest moral, intellectual, and creative leaps you can make. So why do we get stuck inside the feeling of being right? Part of the answer actually has to do with how it feels to be wrong. 
So let me ask you guys a question. How does it feel emotionally? How does it feel to be wrong? This is a real question. You can answer it, like with your voices. <laughs> How does it feel to be wrong? Bad. It's a good one-syllable solid answer. How else? How does it feel? Shame. You feel shame. What else? Anger. Guilty. Yeah, great. Okay, these are excellent answers. It feels terrible. You feel ashamed and embarrassed. You feel angry. You feel guilty. These are great answers. But they are answers to a different question. You guys are answering the question, how does it feel to realize that you're wrong? Realizing that you're wrong can feel like all of those things, and a lot of other things. You know, it can be devastating. It can be revelatory. It can actually be fairly funny, like my silly Chinese character mistake. But just being wrong? That doesn't feel like anything. I'll give you an analogy. When I was a little kid, I used to like to watch um, cartoons on television. And in particular, I loved this one Looney Tunes cartoon where there's this kind of pathetic coyote who's always chasing and never catching up to a roadrunner. Do you guys have any idea what I'm talking about? Yeah. Just, okay, good. <laughs> so in pretty much every episode of this cartoon, there's this moment where the coyote is chasing the roadrunner and the roadrunner runs off a cliff, which is totally fine. Roadrunners are birds, you know, they can fly. But the thing is that the coyote runs off the cliff also. And what's funny about this, at least if you're seven years old, is that he's totally fine too. He just keeps running. Right up until the moment that he looks down and realizes that he's in midair. That's when he falls. When we're wrong about something, not when we've realized it, but before that, we're like that coyote after he's gone off the cliff and before he looks down. You know, we're already wrong. We're already in trouble. But we feel like we're on solid ground. So I should actually correct something I said a moment ago. It does feel like something to be wrong. It feels like being right. I call this problem error blindness. Most of the time, we don't have any kind of internal cue to let us know that we're wrong about something until it's too late. And the problem with this is that it turns out that internal cues are exactly what we rely on to figure out whether we're right or wrong. To the extent that we bother to investigate our beliefs, which is frankly not very far, basically what we usually do is we just engage in a little introspection. We sort of peer inside ourselves and think, does this feel right? Is there any evidence internally, emotionally, or otherwise that I might be wrong? And then we draw our conclusions. This is an incredibly flawed strategy. It's going to fail you 95% of the time. And I want to give you a very, very quick illustration as to why. So this is one of my favorite optical illusions. Some of you might have seen it before. Here's the trick. The square labeled A and the square labeled B are the exact same shade of gray. Now, if you've never seen this illusion before, you're having trouble believing me, because you are looking at it, <laughs> and it is completely self-evident that A is much darker than B. The first time I saw this illusion, it was in a book, and now that I've written one of my own, I'm slightly embarrassed to admit this, but I was so frustrated by this that I finally just tore the page out of the book, took a pair of scissors, cut the optical illusion apart, whereupon, lo and behold, a and B turn out to be exactly the same color. Now, I cannot cut apart your lovely projection screens here, but what I can do is show you a second image. So now, all of a sudden, it's not quite as obvious what's going on here. What I love about this illusion is it makes it very clear that something can seem completely self-evident, that you can feel absolutely certain about it, 
and you can still be entirely wrong. Now, in fairness, of course, the deck is kind of stacked here, right? I mean, the whole point of an optical illusion is to make you feel convinced about something so that I can then say, ha, no, sorry, you're all wrong. But the fact is, we actually have experiences like this in our everyday lives all the time. I am reasonably confident that every single person in this room has had the experience of making a bet. Not like at the racetracks, I mean a factual bet, like, you know, who hosted the 1948 Winter Olympics or whatever. And the whole reason you make that bet is because you know that you're right, right? I mean, you're standing there shaking your friend's hand, feeling very smug, and then five minutes later, you're forking over 10 euros, and you're like, what just happened? Right? I mean, it's genuinely confusing, that moment, because when you made the bet, you could feel that knowledge inside yourself. You wouldn't have made it otherwise. And then, like, poof, it collapses out from under you, and it's very unsettling, even about trivial things. I am also reasonably certain that everybody in this room is old enough to have had the experience of being in love, and then of not being in love anymore. And it's actually kind of similar, right? I mean, you have this absolute internal clarity, you have a whole picture of your life, you have a whole image of your future, and then something shifts. And suddenly the whole picture looks different. And what's important about this is that there's no way for us to sense that shift coming until it happens. That is the problem of error blindness. And that is one reason, kind of a structural reason, if you will, that we get trapped inside this feeling of being so right all the time. But there's also a second reason, and this reason is cultural. Think back for a moment to elementary school. You're sitting there in your classroom, and your teacher is passing back quiz papers. And one of them looks like this. This is not mine, by the way. <laughs> not that I would object to making so many mistakes. But there you are, you're in elementary school, and you know exactly what to think about the kid who got this paper back. That's the dumb kid. That's the troublemaker. That's the one who never does his homework. So by the time you are, you know, seven or eight or nine years old, you've already learned two incredibly powerful lessons about making mistakes. The first one is that people who make mistakes are lazy, irresponsible idiots. And the second one is that the way to succeed in life is to never make any mistakes. So what do we think about these lessons? Well, we already know the first one cannot be right. Right, remember this? Oops, that's the wrong direction, speaking of mistakes. We have already decided collectively as a species through every major field that investigates what it means to be human that all human beings get stuff wrong. This is not the unique province of kids who don't do their homework. But what about the second lesson? What about this idea that the way to succeed is to just not make mistakes? Does that work? You know, actually, yeah. Some of the times it does. If your goal in life is to get every kid in the English-speaking world to spell vegetable the same way, or to get every single widget that's coming off of your conveyor belt to be exactly half an inch thick, you can achieve that goal by focusing on eliminating mistakes. In other words, if you are striving towards something, towards a goal, that has a uniform, predictable, narrow, and foreordained outcome, you can achieve that goal by focusing on eliminating mistakes. And in fact, you probably should. The problem with this, of course, is that most of life, and frankly, most of the really interesting parts of life, do not involve narrow, specific, uniform, and foreordained outcomes. You know, if instead your goal is to develop a better search engine or come up with some cool new mobile app or broker peace in the Democratic Republic of Congo or write a sonata or work on a relationship or raise your kids, you cannot succeed at any of that by focusing on eliminating mistakes. 
And in fact, you cannot succeed at any of that if you are afraid of making mistakes. On the contrary, to do any of those things, you are going to make mistakes all along the line. And those mistakes are going to be the engine of your progress. They are going to be what advances you toward your ultimate success. The problem is that's not the lesson that we learn about mistakes. We learn these lessons instead. And we learn them incredibly well. And a lot of us respond to them basically by becoming little A students, you know, perfectionists and overachievers. And that's fine in some ways. I mean, there's something to be said for those qualities. But the problem with being a perfectionist and an overachiever, and I know what I'm talking about because I am one of you, is that then we freak out at the possibility that we've gotten something wrong. Because according to this, getting something wrong means that there's something wrong with us. And so we just cling to this conviction that we're right because it makes us feel smart and responsible and virtuous and safe. The trouble, of course, is that insisting that we're right is actually the exact opposite of being smart, responsible, virtuous, and safe. And I will tell you a quick story that will make this very plain. This story is set in 2008 at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center in Boston. Um, Beth Israel is the teaching hospital for Harvard University. It's one of the best hospitals in the United States. So one day in the summer of 2008, this woman comes into the hospital for a surgery. She's taken into the operating room. She's anesthetized. The surgeon does his thing, stitches her up, sends her out to the recovery room. It all seems to have gone totally smoothly. And the woman wakes up, and she looks down at herself, and she says, why is the wrong side of my body in bandages? Well, the wrong side of her body is in bandages because the surgeon has performed a major operation on her left leg instead of her right one. Some of y'all have a sick sense of humor. <laughs> when the vice president of healthcare quality for Beth Israel spoke publicly about this incident, he said something very interesting. He said, for whatever reason, the surgeon simply felt that he was on the correct side of the patient. You can probably see where this is going. Trusting too much in the feeling of being on the correct side of anything can be very dangerous. This internal sense of rightness that we all experience so much of the time is not a reliable guide to what is actually going on in the external world. And when we act like it is, and we stop entertaining the possibility that we could be wrong, you know, yeah, that is when we make major medical mistakes, and when we put innocent people in prison, and when we spill 200 million gallons of oil into the Gulf of Mexico, or torpedo the global economy. So this attachment to being right and resistance to contemplating the possibility that we could be wrong is a major practical problem in all of our lives. But it's also a major social and ethical and interpersonal problem. Think for a moment about what it means to be absolutely certain that you're right about something. It means that you think your beliefs about the world perfectly reflect the world as it ex really is. And when you think that, you have a problem you need to solve, which is how are you going to explain all of those people who disagree with you? Well, it turns out that most of us solve this problem the exact same way, by resorting to a series of unfortunate assumptions. The first thing we typically do when someone disagrees with us is we just assume that they're ignorant. You know, they don't have access to all the same facts and data that we do. And when we generously share that information with them, they're going to see the light and they're going to come on over to our side. When that doesn't work out, when it turns out that people who disagree with us are looking at all of the same information that we are, we move on to a second assumption, which is that they're idiots. 
right? They have all of the right pieces of the puzzle, and they are too moronic to put them together correctly. And when that doesn't work out, when it turns out that people who disagree with us have all the same information we do, and are actually pretty smart, which, by the way, is a concession that we're very reluctant to make to people who disagree with us, but occasionally we do. And when we get there, we move on to a third assumption. They know the truth, and they are deliberately distorting or concealing it for some kind of evil purpose of their own. When I put these assumptions up behind me on a screen in, you know, 60-point font or whatever, they seem patently ridiculous. I mean, obviously, everybody who disagrees with me is not the spawn of Satan. And yet, these assumptions are unbelievably common. I mean, I don't know if it's as bad here in France as it is in the U.S., but, you know, turn on TV news. Turn on talk radio. You can't get away from these assumptions. And if you turn off the TV and turn off the radio and listen to your own mind long enough, I have a feeling you're going to hear them there, too. So this is kind of a catastrophe. Our attachment to being right and our resistance to being wrong keeps us from preventing mistakes when we absolutely need to and causes us to treat each other terribly. So obviously, we need an entirely different attitude toward being wrong. And it's actually quite, sp quite simple. In specific, we just need to invert the attitude we currently have. We need to let go of our attachment to being right and we need to embrace the possibility that we're wrong. The very good news on this front is this is completely doable. Our attitudes towards being wrong are not biological, they're not hair color, they're not height. They're cultural, they're something that we learn and something that we teach, which means that we can change them. The slightly less good news is that I am not equipped to change them for everybody in this room in one hour on some lovely sunny afternoon in Paris. Like almost anything that's worth doing in life, it takes practice. You have to want to change, and then you have to work on changing, and you have to understand why it matters to change. But what I can do is try to inspire that change in you. And since I myself am frankly not that inspiring, I thought I would introduce you to a couple of people, three people, who might be able to inspire you to rethink your relationship to being wrong. First one is this guy. This is Ed Wiesters. Ed is one of the world's greatest living mountaineers. He's climbed all 20 of the world's highest peaks without supplemental oxygen, which is basically insane. Uh, some of you might recognize him, actually, from the, at this point, kind of old IMAX movie about Everest, if any of you ever saw it. He was the star of that movie. He's been up Mount Everest eight times, also without supplemental oxygen. And of course, Ed doesn't just go up these mountains alone, right? He leads entire teams of people up and down them. So he is someone who has thought very hard about risk and error and managing both of them in incredibly dangerous, high-stakes situations, situations where literally lives, including his own, are on the line. I had the chance to interview Ed last year, and at some point in the course of the interview, I asked him to tell me about the worst mistake he'd ever made on a mountain. And Ed proceeded to tell me the most unbelievably boring story you can possibly imagine. Basically, it went like this. He says, well, this one time I was up on K2. K2 is the second highest mountain in the world. I'm up on K2, and the weather was getting kind of bad, and I thought, ah, you know, we should probably turn around. But we didn't turn around, and we kept going up. And the weather got worse, and I thought, Ed, man, you should really turn around. But we didn't turn around. And then we got to the top, and then we came back down. I'm like, Ed, dude, people die in those mountains. 
They lose their climbing partners. They lose their limbs. They get hypothermia. This is all you've got for me? And Ed got very serious. And he looked at me and he said, a mistake is a mistake whether you pay for it or not. I can't tell you how many times I've thought about those words since that conversation. This, to me, is an incredibly admirable attitude toward being wrong. Most of us cannot recognize, acknowledge, and learn from our mistakes even when we do pay for them, or worse still, when other people pay for them. And here was a guy who was able to recognize and learn from a mistake that he got away with. And he really did learn from it. Later on in that same conversation, he told me, you know, ever since that time, on K2, when I'm on a mountain and I hear a voice inside me saying, this could be a mistake, I pack up my ego and I pack up my team and I go back down that mountain. This is a lesson I think we could all stand to learn, that in those moments when we hear a voice inside us saying, nah, or a voice around us saying, you could be making a mistake, to pack up our egos and back down. So Ed, I think, really embodies what I think of as kind of the ideal, practical attitude toward error. But I also, before I end today, want to introduce you to two people who I think embody the ideal philosophical attitude toward error. And since I am in France, it seemed only fair to use a French representative of my cause. That's this guy. This, of course, is Michel de Montaigne, one of my personal heroes, uh, the great Renaissance writer and thinker. There's many, many, many interesting things about Montaigne, but possibly the most famous is that above the door to his study, he inscribed these words. Que sais-je? What do I know? A lot of you probably know this story, but I want you to think about it for a moment and about what it means. You know, I have this little niece. She's two years old, so she just learned to talk fairly recently. And not that long ago, she said her first ever complete sentence. And her first sentence was, I know. She's two. And the world is a very confusing place. But the very first thing she did was stake a flag and say, I know. And this to me is classic, right? From the moment we can talk until the moment we go to our graves, we love to declaim our knowledge and to prove how much we know. And knowledge is great. Knowledge is incredibly important, don't get me wrong. But think about the world we actually live in for a moment. You know, we live in an unbelievably noisy, complicated, confusing information environment. And not only that, we live in a tiny portion of it. You know, we only see the immediate world around us. Most of it is occluded from us. Most of the world to say nothing of most of the universe. And we also only live in a tiny moment of it. You know, if we're very lucky, we get 80 years, we get 100 years. It's nothing. Most of the information in the world happened before we came around, and a lot of stuff we're only going to figure out and understand as a species long after I'm gone and after all of us in this room are gone. In other words, time and space and the complexity of knowledge all work against the likely accuracy of that statement, I know. We do know some things, but mostly we don't know. But ask yourself this, when was the last time you said, I don't know? You probably said, I know, really recently. We do it all the time. But we're much less willing to acknowledge our ignorance. And I think this is what Montaigne understood, that ignorance is our likely state, that it's incredibly important, that it's a way of paying homage to the complexity and mystery of the world, and just as important, that most of life's 
best adventures and most of our greatest advancements and breakthroughs do not start in knowledge. They start in ignorance. They start when we look at something and we furrow our brow and we say, huh, I don't know. That to me is a lovely philosophical attitude and it's very nicely complemented by the third and final person I'm going to introduce you today. And that's this guy. This is St. Augustine. 1,200 years before Descartes said his famous thing about I think, therefore I am, Augustine sat down and he wrote this, Fallor ergo sum, I err, therefore I am. Augustine understood that our capacity to get things wrong is not some kind of regrettable defect in the human system. It's something we can eradicate or overcome. It is absolutely fundamental to who we are. And not just to who we are as a whole species, but to who each one of us is as an individual. I mean, think back for one moment to my silly Chinese character mistake. What happened in that instant? You know, I looked at something that the entire world sees one way, and I saw something totally different. That is pretty much the definition of a mistake. But it's also the definition of creativity. Your capacity to get things wrong is completely inseparable from your imagination. It's completely inseparable from your intellect. That is what Augustine understood. And it's the deep meaning behind these shallow, cliched expressions like, to err is human. And so I would put it to you that one of the most human and humane things you can possibly do is learn to emulate these three people I just introduced, to be humble in the face of life's risks, to be awed in the face of its mysteries, and to be willing to ask yourselves, wow, I don't know. What if I'm wrong? Thank you so much. <laughs>